Hey, what's going on guys? It's your boy Mike and I'm back with another video. Today we're going to talk about Toys R Us and specifically the reboot. The company had been out of business dead. All the stores across the U.S. have been closed. You've probably seen some of these big empty buildings. You saw the news stories and the social media outcry when this beloved brand uh, took it in the neck. But now they have come out with two new stores. They opened one in Paramus, New Jersey, and they another one they opened up in, I want to say, Houston, Texas. And this was right before the Thanksgiving holiday, just in time for that sweet, sweet holiday shopping money to come rolling in. But what I want to do today is I want to answer a question. And the question is, is the reboot, is the new Toys R Us, is it a phoenix arising from the ashes, a beautiful bird to regale us with its glory and its majesty? Or is the new Toys R Us a zombie, a soulless, brain-dead corpse walking the face of the earth in search of a dollar. Now, you can cast your votes. You can probably guess where I'm going to go with this. This story is going to blow your mind. So I want to get into it. What I'm going to do today, I'm going to talk a little bit about the background of the company. I'm going to talk about what happened. How did the company fail? And then I want to talk about the new model and the players involved, and then we'll talk about the brand. It's going to be a little bit of a long video just because there's a lot to cover, but this is all related. I've, I've tried to distill it down as best I could. Get yourself some popcorn, sit back, and let's do this thing. The company started in 1948, a guy named Charlie Lazarus. He was a World War II vet. He came home from the war, and uh, he started up a baby furniture company in New Jersey. And the company uh, was doing fine, but Charlie very quickly realized that there's a lot of money to be made and selling children's toys. And so over a 10 year period, he focused the business, got rid of the, the baby furniture over time and focused solely on selling children's toys. In 1958, he rebranded it and called it Toys R Us. And that's the genesis of the brand that we have come to know and mostly, mostly love. So in 1958, they become Toys R Us. Now, fast forward 20 years, this Charlie, he's a hustler. I mean, in 20 years, 1978, he was able to take the company public. He got it listed on the stock exchange. And with all the investment that flowed in and the support and the publicity, Charlie was able to take this company and expand it across the U.S. And they built these stores. They were 30, 40, 80,000 square feet. The model was to have these huge stores that inventoried every single toy imaginable from floor to ceiling. It was like a temple to toys a giant warehouse of toys. And if you've ever been in a Toys R Us, you know that the shopping experience, if you're an adult, isn't the greatest. But if you were a kid, man, going to a Toys R Us, dude, you were going to score. I mean, you were going to come home with some loot. And uh, so Toys R Us holds a really special place. But that was the model. And he was able to expand this company all across the U.S. They became the leading retailer of toys in the U.S. I mean, it's a huge accomplishment. <laughs> You know, the company's at the top of its game. It's got this model where it inventories everything. It's, it's, the, it's a place to go. They're using their buying power to get good pricing, and they're putting their competitors out of business. But very slowly, Toys R Us started to find that it was struggling. It started with online sales. You'd be forgiven for thinking that like, oh, it was the e-commerce that killed Toys R Us. They absolutely fumbled that ball and they struggled with it, but that is not why Toys R Us failed. So early on, they had to deal with Amazon. This was early, early days. And they said to Amazon, look, uh, we'll sell our toys exclusively through you online. We won't sell anywhere else online. We'll use your platform as our way to sell. But what we're asking for you from you is that you would sell only our toys. Let's, let's be BFFs. I'll sell my stuff, but you don't sell anybody else's. And Amazon and said, sure, let's do it. And of course, Amazon being Amazon, they cannot pass up an opportunity to make a buck. This company, Amazon, when it sees a dollar, it can't help itself. It just has to get it. And so what ended up happening is that Amazon started selling other people's toys. They didn't have a discussion with Toys R Us. They just started selling other people's toys. Toys R Us upset. They take their ball and go home. They try to take Amazon to court and uh, they weren't really that successful. But the long and short of it is, you know, Toys R Us was the loser because they couldn't crack that online sales code. They just couldn't figure out how to transact online and, and nail the e-commerce piece. Now, this did lead to some declining sales, but it was not the nail in the coffin that you would have expected. They still were huge. They still had a lot of momentum. Around the time that they were struggling with their e-commerce strategy, along came the big boxes. And these guys really uh, took it to, to, to Toys R Us. What they ended up doing was they used Toys R Us and its strengths against it. So you think about Toys R Us, they got all this inventory, they got all these toys available, everything in the world. A place like Walmart or uh, Target, they've only got three or four aisles of toys. And you think, well, how can they compete against Toys R Us? 
But what Walmart and Target figured out, especially Walmart uh, in, in the early days, is that I don't have to necessarily carry every single toy. You see, children are followers by nature. Children are not out there going, I want this esoteric thing that nobody else offers. And quite frankly, now that we're in the internet age, if you've got a kid that wants a strange thing that nobody else has, you can go online and get it. But the, the average kid, they want what their pals have. If I'm going to school and everybody's got Polly Pockets, well, then I got to have Polly Pockets. You know, if uh, there's a favorite TV show that I'm watching, like Power Rangers or Transformers, then I want to have the merch from that thing. And so what Walmart and, and also Target figured out is we don't have to stock everything. All we have to do is be good at keeping our finger on the pulse of the trends that are happening at the time and make sure to stock those things. And they had another thing working in their favor. If I take my kid to buy G.I. Joe with the Kung Fu grip, I've got two choices now. I can either take him to Walmart or Target or I can take him to Toys R Us. Now, if I take him to Toys R Us, pricing's okay I and mean, they get good prices, but uh, not necessarily the best. And I can't really do anything else. Like if I take him there, I can't accomplish anything else besides getting that G.I. Joe. But if I take him to Walmart and Walmart figure this out, uh, Walmart's going to offer that G.I. Joe as a loss leader. They're going to get it out there as cheaply as they can. They're probably willing to take a little bit of a hit if they have to. So Walmart's, Walmart's offering a better price. And by the way, while I'm there getting little Johnny, his G.I. Joe, well, I can pick up a gallon of milk, a loaf of bread, maybe some bath towels for the bath, maybe a toaster for the kitchen, maybe a quart of oil for uh, the pickup truck out back. I mean, I can get all of my household shopping done in one stroke. And so what Walmart and, and Target and the other big boxes figured out is we don't have to do everything that Toys R Us does. In fact, we can use their strengths against them as a weakness, and we can start pulling away revenue. And they did exactly that, and it worked. The declining sales for Toys R Us was mainly due to the pressure from the big box stores, and then their inability to figure out the e-commerce piece didn't help. I mean, it just added to the pain. And so Toys R Us found itself in a steady state of decline. Well, this is a company that's on the publicly traded stock markets. You jump forward uh, to 2005, and an investment group came along and said, look, we'd like to buy the business. We'd like to take it off the market and make it private. And this group was led by Bain Capital, KKR, and a group called Vornado, Vornado being the biggest real estate trust in New York City. And these guys came together and said, look, we're going to give you $6.6 .6 billion dollars to own Toys R Us. And the shareholders were like, let's do it. We love it. And so they're able to put a deal together. But there's a thing about that deal that people need to realize, and that is that this was a leveraged buyout. And this is so important. What the folks at Bain and KKR and Vornado, and Bain was the master of leveraged buyouts back in the day, what they did is they said, look, we're going to go get loans. We're going to finance this deal. Mainly, we're not going to come with bags of cash. We're going to get loans, and we're going to use the assets of Toys R Us to secure those loans. So what happened was on day one, the day that Toys R Us came off the stock exchange and became a privately owned business by this venture group. It had $5.3 billion in debt on its balance sheet. It's like a brand new baby, fresh to the world, new baby smell, but it owes $5.3 billion. And it was just an, an enormous amount of weight on its shoulders from day one. And what that resulted in was Toys R Us having to pay $400 million a year just to service its debt, just to take care of interest and maybe chip away at principal. And so as you can imagine, the company struggled. This was 2005 when the deal happened. And come 2017, Toys R Us <laughs> dropped to its knees and begged for mercy. It cried uncle. It's, it, it tapped out. It said, I can't do this anymore. And it filed for bankruptcy. Now, when you hear bankruptcy, what you think of is the company was going out of business, but it's not what they wanted to do. With bankruptcy, what they wanted to do was to restructure the debt. They wanted their uh, folks, that have, their lenders, to take a haircut, to take a hit. Look, let's get a lot of the debt off of our shoulders. Let's eliminate it through bankruptcy. We can then be in a better place to make you money down the road. Because we have two options. We can shut down today and you can make nothing. You can lose everything. Or you can take a bit of a hit with the hope of making some money down the road. Now, look, a lot of these lenders said, yeah, you know what? We're fine with that. We understand that it's either a big fat goose egg today or we had the opportunity to make a little bit of money down the road. Let's go through bankruptcy. But there was one problem. <laughs> there were a group of lenders led by a group called uh, Solus uh, Alternative Asset Management that uh, said, we don't, we don't like that idea so much. You see, Solus 
uh, was probably one of the biggest lenders to Toys R Us. They had almost a billion dollars in loans that they had provided, like $900 million and change. And they had securitized that loan with the intellectual property of Toys R Us, meaning if you don't pay me back my billion bucks, I get to take the intellectual property, which included the Toys R Us brand, the Babies R Us brand, and even Jeffrey the Giraffe. We get to own those assets, among other things. Well, Solace and their partners stood up and said, no, we're not willing to go through bankruptcy. We're not willing to take a haircut. We would rather see the company shut down. And so... That's what it did. And in 2018, Toys R Us was no more. They shut down over 800 stores across the country. They displaced thousands and thousands of retail workers, put these people out of work and and looking for new jobs, and uh, broke the hearts of millions and millions of people that remember those nostalgic times of shopping at Toys R Us. So we're sitting here today, 2019, right now it's just after Thanksgiving, but a few weeks ago they rolled out two new stores, as I mentioned. Now you say to yourself, well, what happened? I thought the company was dead, and the the original company still is dead. But if you remember this group, Solace uh, Alternative Asset Management, which is essentially a type of hedge fund manager, if you remember, they're the ones now that own the brand. They own the new brand. And so what they did is they fired up a company called True Kids, T R U. Kids. Essentially, what they're doing is they have developed partnerships. You go, okay, big deal. Businesses do partnerships all the time. But specifically, what they've done is they are saying, look, we're the brand holders. We own the rights and the equity that uh, that uh, Toys R Us represents. They've gone to a company called Beta, B-8-T-A, very trendy, hip uh, startup name. And Beta is essentially a company that provides retail as a service. What retail as a service means is that you can go to Beta and say, look, I want to have a retail operation, but I don't want to own the square footage. I don't want to deal with the customers. I don't want to deal with hiring employees. I don't want to deal with merchandising, et cetera. I want someone else to deal with that. I just want to bring my brand equity to the table, and I want you guys to run my retail operation for me. So what Beta does is retail as a service. So you've got Toys R Us or True Kids working with Beta. And you say, okay, well, it's pretty clever, actually. And there's a third partner in this that I need to mention. It's kind of ironic, but one of the companies that was eating Toys R Us's lunch back in the day, big box store, is Target. So you walk into one of these 10,000 square foot shops now in a mall, and it's nothing like these giant 80,000 square foot stores like they used to have, but you walk in, you can play with the toys, Beta's running the whole retail experience, and now it's time to check out. And they've got these digital kiosks. When you hit Add to Cart, in the store. It's almost like shopping online, but you're in the store. You're being taken to Target's e-commerce platform, and it lets you know that this is powered by Target. And so what's happening is Target is inventorying all the toys. Target is running the e-commerce platform. Target is even providing the fulfillment, meaning they're shipping the product to your house. So when you're buying, you're not buying from True Kids. You're not even buying from Beta. You're buying from Target. So what they've done is quite clever on one level is they've said, look, we're not going to we're not going to take the risk on retail space and having all this overhead. We're not going to try to crack that code. We'll go to somebody else who's figured it out. Hey, we struggle with the e-commerce piece. We're not going to try to do that either. We'll go to somebody else that's figured that out. So on one level, you go, that's really smart. They're avoiding their weakness and focusing on their strengths. But what they built is this partnership. So each group at the table uh, owns and operates one aspect of this Toys R Us business. So when you get behind the the scenes, it's really not necessarily uh, a new company. It is technically a new company. But there are multiple companies behind this kind of brand that is called Toys R Us. When I look at this, as I said, I do think that there's an element that that deserves respect. It's a very clever way to go about it. But let me talk about the brand. I mean, you can get into all kinds of things about will this be sustainable? Will consumers like the new shopping experience and et cetera? And and like I said, we could do a whole video on that. I'm not going to touch on that today. I want to ask some important questions around the brand. Specifically, I want to kind of ask the question, what is True Kids and what is Toys R Us going to do when the brand is confronted with tough decisions? And that's such a crucial aspect of a brand. All brands face tough decisions on a, on a regular basis, not just once in a blue moon. Not, not some big kind of political, you know, oh, there's this huge political crisis and what's the brand going to do? But on a day-by-day, moment-by-moment basis, brands face tough decisions. For instance, these new stores are loaded with microphones and hidden cameras. So when you're in there shopping with your little, your little offspring, uh, it's filming you and listening to you. 
Now, a brand has to look at this and go, well, what, what are we going to do with this? Is this ethical to do? Is this moral? Is this right? Is this on brand for us? Does this go against our brand principles? Are we betraying the promise that we're making to our customers? Or is this in line with the promise? And brands are faced with questions every day. How are we going to behave? Are we going to go left or right? Up or down? What are we going to say no to? What are we going to say yes to? Who do we partner with and why, why do we partner with them? The excellent brands make these decisions on criteria that go well beyond making a profit. I mean, excellent brands generate wealth, they create value, they enrich people's lives, they solve problems. Brands bring so much to the table, and really these are companies that are that are brands. But they have to have a deeper moral compass. They have to have some animating principle. They have to have a why. You know, Simon Sinek talks about the why. Why do they get out of bed in the morning? What drives them? What's their vision? What's their mission? Behind a good brand are all those questions well answered, well considered, well thought about. Now, I'm not accusing True Kids or Solace Asset Management or any of these guys of not having thought about these things. It's possible that they have. But I really do have a concern. When I, when I hear about a hedge fund that specializes in distressed assets, I have to say that you know, there's nothing wrong with having that kind of a specialty, as Solace does. But I have to question like what, what criteria goes into making up the values of the Toys R Us brand? Is this just an opportunity to say, look, we've got this asset. You know, I've got this old car. It's worth some money. I'm going to list it on Craigslist and try to make a few bucks off of it? Or is there a deeper principle animating this business? Now, let's say that there is a deeper principle. Let's give them the benefit of the doubt. They want to really do good in the world. I get that. You can be a venture capitalist and still want to do good in the world. I believe that. I really do. But you've got this other wrinkle, and that is that you've got other parties at the table that have a really big say. It's one thing to say, like, we own our brand. We've got our store. We kind of have to, we, we got rid of this vendor because we, we weren't aligned and I found a new vendor. That's fine. But when you have your retail owned by a separate company, when you have your e-commerce and inventory and fulfillment owned by a separate company, you know, this takes it a step further. They're not outsourcing some of this. They have partners at the table, all invested in the Toys R Us or the True Kids Brand. So the question becomes, how do they make these decisions? When they're sitting at that table trying to figure out what to do, how to address difficult de decisions, how to move forward under uh, circumstances that have ethical and moral um, implications, like, for instance, uh, spying essentially on your customers and gathering data on them. You know, what principles, values, and positions animate and inform the brand on how it's going to move forward? So this is the problem that I have with this. I think it's a clever idea. Hats off to them. Kudos. I think it's smart, etc. But I've got a real reservation around the structure in place to keep this brand on the straight and narrow. And quite frankly, the market catches up to these things. People figure it out after a while if there's something deeper there. They're willing to forgive a brand for making a mistake. They're willing to overlook problems if the brand's heading in the right direction generally. But I, I do question this one. So for me, I kind of come down on the side of zombie. I'm not anti Toys R Us. I'm not against this reboot, but I've got some serious misgivings and I think time's going to tell. I'm curious what you think. Do me a favor, throw a comment down below. Let me know what you think about this. Have you done any research? Do you have any insights you'd like to add to the conversation? But let me know. I'd, I'd, be, I'd be interested to uh, hear your thoughts and have a little bit of interaction. Guys, I hope you know. I love you all. I'm grateful for your time. I hope this was useful to you and I will see you in the next video.